too. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to what is our, our third meeting of the Regional Family, Youth, and Health Task Force. Um, looks like we have another good group. Uh, I presume there's going to be some, uh, some stragglers coming in. We have a little bit of traffic problems out there on the freeway Winchester and Jefferson. And I'm sure our friends um, from, I guess, the, uh, the Northeast, uh, San Jacinto and Hemet with the fires going on, we'll, we'll see how they're doing as well. I know they have their hands full out that way. So uh, we'll see how they do. Um, why don't we go ahead and rise for uh, the flag uh, salute. And uh, Julio, would you do the honor, sir? You may be seated. Let's have a roll call. Marianne Edwards. Here. City of Temecula. Rick Gibbs, City here. of Marietta. Did you say here? I did. Oh, oh. you did. Okay. I did say here. Oh, okay. I did, I, did anybody hear that? No. I didn't hear it. Okay. How your school practice? Okay. Uh, Alan Long, Council Member Marietta. Alan coming, do you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Miss Mary Creighton, Canyon Lake. Here. You see, that's how you say here. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Tim Brown, here. Canyon Lake. Here. Hi, Tim. Robert Yusuf, Mayor of Hemet. I didn't see him. Shelly Milne, Council Member Hemet. Ross Valenzuela, Board Member, Hemet Unified School District. Okay. Natasha Johnson, Mayor Pro Tem, City of Lake Elsinore. See her. Steve Manos, Council Member, City of Lake Elsinore. See her. Tom Thomas, Board Member, Los, uh, Lake Elsinore Unified School District. Jerry Bowman, Board Member, Menifee Union School District. See Jerry. Chris Tamazian, Board Member, Murrieta Valley Unified School District. I am here. Julio Rodriguez, Council Member, City of Paris. Here. Rita Rogers, Council Member, City of Paris. Here. Bill Holstrom, Board President, Parish Union High School District. Mark Bartell, Mayor, City of San Jacinto. Crystal Ruiz, Council Member, City of San Jacinto. John Norman, Board President, San Jacinto Unified School District. Dr. Christy Rutz Robbins, Board President, Temecula Valley Unified School District. Michael Vargas, Board President, Val Verde Unified School District. Mayor Nagar, I am present. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Ben Benoit, Council Member, City of Wildemar. Present. And Bridget Moore, Council Member, City of Wildemar. Here. Sounds good. Um, before we get on to committee business, I have a request to speak, and it doesn't look like it's an agenda item, so why don't we just go ahead and, and take that uh, first. That's uh, Dr. Andy Doan. Doc, are you here? Why don't you come on up? And we'll go ahead and give you three minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor Nagar and uh, esteemed council members. Just want to announce a free seminar coming up at Rancho Community Church on July 20th, this Saturday. It starts at 8 o'clock. It's a half-day seminar. We have a series of speakers that will address the solutions that we seek, which is living a life of impact by motivating our youth, from getting away from addictive behaviors such as social media, gaming, drugs, alcohol, violence, and rage, and making an impact by making good positive changes in their lives, stay away from cutting and suicide, as well as let's do something for the community that can leave a lasting legacy. And I have flyers here for anybody who's interested, and I just want to make that announcement so that's a free seminar, and we're starting to make solutions in the city. Great. Thanks. Thank you. You have flyers out on the table? I do. Good. Thanks. All right, let's go to uh, the committee business. Um, let's see. Item one, approval of uh, 6 2013 meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Gibbs, who, who made that second, and moved by, or seconded by Mr. Benoit. Uh, why don't we just do a voice vote? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Those minutes Ab pass. Abstain. Mary Creighton abstains. Okay, got that. Yes, Ms. Rogers. Rita Rogers also abstains. I was absent last meeting. Julio Rodriguez abstains. Oh, got it. Got it. Any other abstentions? Thank you. All right. 
And then we'll move on to item number two, introduction to task force third meeting. That's me, I'm doing that now. Item three, presentation on youth and social media cyber safety. Guest speaker, Wayne Sakamoto. Mr. Sakamoto, welcome, sir. Thank you. You have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see if we can get that switched over. And with the uh, chamber's permission, I would rather move around than, than face you and and have my back to everybody else. Sure. If, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> part of it. Part of it is I work with law enforcement a lot, and I just don't want to be turning my back to the other. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know what, we are, we are recording you, so here comes Jonathan with a portable mic. Let's, let's see here. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, as you're coming down with a portable mic, uh, let me just introduce myself in the, in the topic. We have about an hour to talk about some of the issues of popular culture as it relates to youth risk, cyberbullying, and internet safety. And I want to preface this by saying, thank you, that the internet is first and foremost an amazing tool. It is treme a tremendous resource. Uh, today I'm going to cover some of the darker sides of the internet, some of the things that kids get, are getting into that I think all of us need to be aware of, uh, and especially city, school boards, and community as well. Um, I work with the Murrieta Valley Unified School District. I'm the director of Safe Schools. I've been in that position for about six, maybe seven years. Uh, time is really going by quickly. And I also do some work with the International Bully Prevention Association, the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention, the National Gang Center. Um, the International Chief Association of Chiefs of Police. I'm the volunteer executive director for the California School Resource Officers Association as well. So what we're gonna be covering today is an issue of popular culture and at-risk behaviors. And as I said, that will include cyberbullying, but also we're gonna take a look at some of the websites that are out there uh, that kids are getting into. I'm gonna pose to you, propose to you that in the past, small communities, beautiful communities, seem to be isolated somewhat from the issues of big cities. That is no longer the truth. Any area, whether you're rural, suburban, urban, you're gonna be impacted by the influences of popular culture because of the internet. In the past, if I wanted to know how to do drugs, I'd have to go and I'd have to associate with a drug dealer or people who knew how to do drugs and I would learn from them. Today, I can learn with just a few clicks on, clicks on my computer and scroll down and hit Google search or whatever it is. So every community is at risk today. And I think that's the first lesson that we've learned throughout the nation in dealing with this issue is every community, every neighborhood, every household is now at risk because all this information is readily available and out there. Uh, this is a presentation, and I have, to, I have to put this gentleman up here, Paul Johnson, Detective Johnson with the Marietta Police Department. He and I usually do this training together. Uh, I asked Paul if he would come back from vacation. Um, he's uh, in the Grand Canyon right now, and he told me no, he was going to stay with his family. So <laughs> asked him where his priorities were. So I'll be covering this myself. Um, I, I need to give a waiver because I have up here some items that kids have put up online. So I'm gonna read this real quickly. This session will contain violence, objectionable, objectionable material, profanity, racially insensitive material, etc. The material does not reflect the views of the presenter, uh, our, our organizations, Chris and mine, where we go, uh, nor I'm sure the board and the organizers here, as well as Melissa. Uh, attendance in this class after this waiver has been given is the sole responsibility of the attendee. And this is why I ask that no children be present. I didn't want to give them additional information on what was out there. So that being said, let's do this quiz. Uh, large group, everybody. What's whizzing? Jump in. Urinating? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and just, at least I, at least yeah. I stuck it, stepped yeah. out there, guys. Okay. I knew that. Right. I just wasn't going to say right. it. <laughs> Nos. And, and I am proud to be a resident of Temecula, <laughs> sir. N nitrogen oxide. I knew that. Okay, I take it back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and no, it, it, here's the big thing. If if you were on a school campus and you heard a couple of young people say, "Hey, at lunch, let's sneak out to the parking lot and whiz," you would think. What are, you're going to go urinate in my parking lot. What's wrong with you kids? No, whizzing is smoking marijuana. There is a gentleman, Wiz Khalifa, a very popular uh, contemporary artist who is all about marijuana. 
And so the kids are now calling it whizzing instead of smoking dope. Who's Molly? Oh, beautiful. Molly is short for ecstasy. You guys aren't Googling these things while you're up there, are you? <laughs> <laughs> MDMA. Uh, how about Sally D? Who's Sally D? Sally D is short for salvia divinorum. I think this is going to be the drug of the future because one, salvia divinorum is a legal landscape plant and it is still legal for youth to possess. It's illegal for us to sell it to them, but once it's in their possession, it's legal. The high is like a mix between marijuana and hallucinogenic mushrooms. Isn't that what I have in my garden? Is it a purple flower? Yes, it is. I have those. Well, <laughs> great. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope your home isn't that popular home for teenagers. And you go out there and all your, your plants are stripped Well, loose. you know what? The rabbits eat them. And then I see the rabbits out staggering around the yard. I wonder if that's why. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, could, it very well could be. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, now, there are various versions of salvia. So the one is salvia divinorum. And in fact, if you Googled salvia divinorum, it would show you the exact plant. But there are, are a lot of other salvia plants that are non-hallucinogenic. Uh, but this is a good, cheap high for kids. It lasts 20 minutes. How do they learn this? Search it online. Uh, everybody knows 420. 420 mm -hmm. equals marijuana. It's also Adolf Hitler's birthday. It's the anniversary of Columbine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, dabs. In fact, uh, dabs, wax, and butter. Concentrated THC, concentrated marijuana. <laughs> And so when kids are talking about dabs, that's what they're talking about. Butter is also a way to, to, to concentrate as well as bake it into items. And uh, you can do any YouTube search. You can do a YouTube search on butter, and it will give you the recipe and how to infuse butter, oils, and et cetera into mar into, of marijuana into that item and then cook, cook with it. Uh, spice, not Spice Girls, they're, they're all... <laughs> Uh, spice is actually part of this new synthetic drug movement. So we'll have Spice K2 and a bunch of other blends. All these things are online, and this is what kids are learning. So the lesson is that as adults, we also need to know. Uh, last is vaping on there as a quiz. If you ask kids about vaping, they'll tell you. They'll know it. It's e-cigarettes, but what kids are doing is they're taking the e-cigarettes and they're putting marijuana into it. Oh, my gosh. And so now they're vaping. So it's not about smoking anymore, it's about vaping. So just kind of be aware. And as I said, in the past, this stuff, yeah, great in city areas, they would know it, sophisticated kids, but a few clicks on my computer and the, all these things will pop up. And e-cigarettes are? Oh, the e-cigarettes are electronic cigarettes. So what it is, is generally it was, it was uh, electronic cigarettes were created so that people could get a nicotine fix without smoking tobacco. Um, but what there's, an, there's a heater in a lot of the e-cigarettes that you pack the front tip with marijuana, the heating element heats up the marijuana, and you smoke it. Oh, my gosh. There, there are all kinds of wonderful things out there if you just do an Internet search. Okay, here's Wiz. I'm just going to play a little bit of Wiz Khalifa uh, just so you know why Wiz is now associated with marijuana. So what if we get drunk? So what if we smoke weed? We're just having fun. We don't care who sees. So what if we go out? That's how it's supposed to be. Living young and wild. Really? Living young, wild, and free is going out, getting drunk, smoking weed. This is part of the cultural norm that's out there as kids begin to listen to hip hop and some of the other genre out there that talks about the issue of marijuana use or drug use or sex or whatever it might be, it becomes the youth norm. And again, as adults, we have to be aware that, okay, I will not allow this type of music into my house. You, young man, young lady, you will no longer buy these types of CDs. And they laugh at you because it's not as about CDs anymore. It's about electronic versions. It's about going online and being able to download it online. I got my version right off YouTube. So even as a parent, if we're restricting kids by saying you can't buy that material, they can download it all. 
So uh, just a little bit of core knowledge. The rest of this presentation is based upon social learning theory. Social learning theory says that behaviors are learned through a variety of social interactions. And you can see all the various interactions above there. When kids are young, parents and family are critical in their development. But as they get older, by middle school, peers. kids begin to lean more on their peers to learn. Uh, and then at that time, social, uh, cultural, uh, they learn some of the cultural issues from social media, from media. And so we're going to be covering some of that. Uh, as we take a look at social learning theory and media use, I want you to really take a look at this. The children today spend 7.38 hours every single day with some type of media. Computers, computer games, uh, MP3 players, or MP4 players, or any of the other things that are out there. This is not texting, by the way. 7.38 hours with some type of media. The numbers in parentheses were done five years uh, ago in the study, so about 2005 was 6.5 hours. Video games are in 83% of U.S. homes, up from 65%. And Dr. Doan talked about the issue of, of addiction in video games. It's incredible what happens, and I'm not going to rehash what he said, but um, what's going on with them. But our kids are using video games, and, and the portable ones, the little PlayStations that they get to carry everywhere. Uh, eighth grade boys are playing 23 hours a week. Eighth grade girls play 12 hours a week. But their rate of play is increasing, so they will eventually catch the boys. Here's the striking one. 59% of fourth grade girls and 73% of fourth grade boys' favorite games are violent. So they're learning violence and aggression. 71% of youth 8 to 17 have TV sets in their own rooms. Now, I, I'll admit I'm bitter because when I was growing up, there was one TV set in the whole house. Yeah. And there was a finite time that that thing was on. Uh, and now... TV sets in your own rooms with premium channels. My younger college staff when I worked in San Diego said, you're, you're definitely bitter. And they said, you know what? Back in your day, there were only three channels. Yeah. S so? Two, four, and five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. So now it's 24-7. And premium channels in your own room as a kid? Are you kidding me? It's incredible what kids are seeing today. At 18, they've witnessed 200,000 acts of violence, including 40,000 acts of homicide, of murder. They're desensitized to the violence, from video games to movies, the popular culture that we see. Now, take a look at this. The, that issue of 7.38 hours every day with some type of media, on an average school day, this is how a kid's day basically breaks out. And you'll see something very strange. It adds up to 32.88 hours in one day. So where do kids take the time to be uh, these media consumers? What do you think, what do you, how do you think they juggle their time so that they can, they can stay in touch media-wise? Anytime sleep. the parents aren't home. They don't sleep. Or late at don't. night. They don't, they don't sleep. Yeah. They take it out of their sleep. And the studies on sleep say that teenagers need at least nine hours of sleep for normal brain development. So we're seeing behavior disorders to the issue of children falling asleep in class because they are beginning to hit each other uh, on social networking sites at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The topics, we're going to hit these real quickly, cyberbullying, technology, internet risks, and then general strategies. And I've uh, had a balance between this issue of, uh, of community leaders, uh, business people, professionals, and as well as parents. So we're kind of balancing the mix so that it's going to, going to um, be appropriate for everyone in this room. Uh, the other thing that I, I'm going to say is that as I start this, uh, I, have, I, I have some slides in here uh, that were taken offline, some fights that were taken offline. Now. I want to tell you that I, what I did, and I did this intentionally, is I pulled the fights I usually use out of this video and I searched fights for in Riverside. I hope none of you are from the city of Riverside. I, and I did that because I know that politics of issues that we are not, we don't want to point the finger at any one area. I will tell you, I can do a search for sites in Marietta, Menifee, Temecula, Lake Elsinore, Hemet, San Jacinto, anywhere, and I'll find them online. 
I will search for drug use in these areas, and it's online. Um, so I want you to know that while I, while I didn't pull anyone's locally, uh, what we did is we did uh, pull them out of Riverside. So if you have friends in Riverside, you know, don't tell them that I targeted them. <laughs> you know, just it's everywhere. Okay, cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is the use of electronic, uh, modern electronic communications technologies to intentionally hurt somebody. It's the issue of using social media sites. And as we talk about social media sites, we used to talk a lot about Facebook. Well, you guys remember before Facebook, MySpace? Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about MySpace. Oh, these kids are cyberbullying. They're doing all this stuff on MySpace. And then guess what happened to MySpace? Adults got into MySpace. We started setting up our own MySpace uh, accounts. And all of a sudden, the kids, the younger people were saying, well, it's not cool. We've got all these old people on here. So let's go somewhere else. They went to Facebook. So what's happening with Facebook? How many of you, ha how many have uh, Facebook? Uh, okay, great, yeah, yep, me too. So now the kids are saying, hey, that's not cool. All these guys have Facebook things, so they're jumping out. So right now, a lot of it is Instagram. W this year, for the first time, the majority of cyberbullying cases that I was involved in uh, r was done on Instagram and not on Facebook. So things do change. Uh, let's see, let's jump here, uh, let's jump. I, I, I want to ask, and this is important, I think, for a room like this. I want to ask, whose responsibility is it to deal with, with cyberbullying? Let's say a, a, an event happens at 3 o'clock in the morning from home computer to home computer. Whose jurisdiction does that fall in if a kid says, I hate you, I don't like you, you're ugly, and I'm going to get everybody to not like you? It should be parents. It should be parents, absolutely. One, the new laws are very clear. Schools, we have limited jurisdiction over cyberbullying. We might not like it, but we have limited jurisdiction. It is families that have to deal with it, as well as communities. And I say that it's perfect in a room like this because the reality is we all have a part in it to either prevent or intervene, but we might not have jurisdiction. If a threat has not been made, then law enforcement does not have jurisdiction. If it's low level, it really has to be a community-wide effort to deal with this issue of cyberbullying. Here's a couple just from, from, from my school district, Shavela versus Thompson. You guys remember how the popularity pages that were, you remember those books that went out, other than the slam books, there were the, you know, the cool books? And you said you put somebody's name in there and you said how cool <coughs> they were, how cute they are. All this popularity stuff is online now. So you will see uh, on Shavela versus Thompson, Shavela Middle School versus Thompson Middle School, and as I said, I can find page, similar pages for any school district out there. I just happen to be showing ours. Uh, in this case, you take a look at the issue of girls versus girls. They put two pictures up there, and these girls are not in competition. They didn't put their pictures up. Some other person put the pictures up there for them. And now everybody makes comments about who's cuter, who's hotter, oh who's better, gosh. who's smarter, who's, who's just cooler. Can you imagine being the young lady who sees you, you get trashed on the page? And you want to go to school the next day? Mm -mm. There's something that was up that was called Murtown's Burn Book. And this is why I also say it's a good issue of partnership. Our law enforcement had this page pulled down because of how hurtful it is. Murtown's burn book was a slam book put up online. And in Murtown's burn book, Murtown lists other than beauties, he lists uglies, sluts, and cuties. How would you like to wake up one morning and your friends call you and they say, hey, you're on, you're on Murtown's burn book. And I, I also want to say this, as we investigated Murtown's burn book, it wasn't just kids in Murrieta. These kids, our kids in this valley, all know, they know each other. And so we saw kids from Menifee in there and San Jacinto and Hemet and Lake Elsinore. These kids connect and communicate with each other online, which is a powerful, powerful thing if you're doing it correctly and can be valley-wide hurtful if you're doing mean things with it. I'm not going to get into some of the details on what was said, but there, somebody posts a picture of a girl and they say she is very effing ugly. And now everybody makes comments about this young lady. 
cyberbullying, the use of technology is getting out of control. Uh, when I was talking to a group of Vista, Mar uh, Vista Marietta leadership kids, awesome young people that I got to work with, one of these young men says, cyberbullying is out of control. People are saying all kinds of things online they would never say to someone in person. Something needs to be done. It's all about Facebook right now, and it's crazy. And I wish I could put the emphasis in what I said in that from what I got from his voice. He was, he was, his voice was basically one of urgency, and I need, somebody needs to help. Somebody needs to put a stop to this. And then this is one of my favorites, the bottom one, 2007, from uh, when I was doing some work in the Santee area. Seventh grade girl comes up and says, of course I spread rumors on my phone and on the internet. I'm a seventh grade girl. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what she thought her role was, is to spread rumors. To be popular is to spread rumors. So when we, do, when we take responsibility as a school district in the issue of cyberbullying, I need to be able to show a nexus, that con con connection between home computer to home computer and my school. And the way I can do it is through victim impact statements. If the victim says, I don't feel like coming to school, it's impacting my grades or impacting other services that I get from the school, I can then begin to look at taking action. Bystanders, friends, perpetrators, if I can identify them. If kids share that uh, on smartphones, if they share that information at school, I can take action. But otherwise, I'm limited. I have to try to begin to show the nexus. If I cannot show the nexus as a school system, I can't do anything from home computer to home computer or smartphone to home computer in the middle of the night. The law is clear. As schools, we can only take action if it's done on school equipment during the school day or at on school property. Does that also include informing the parent? Uh, definitely, I can inform parents. I'm basically saying I cannot uh, discipline if we catch them. So just some tips, um, and I think this is the other way that as a partner between cities, school districts, and community, is to post tips for parents on our websites because this is such a pervasive issue that part of getting a handle on it is giving parents tips and strategy. So some of the things, uh, have children sign contracts on appropriate use. Discuss scenarios with them. As parents, have scenarios. What would you do if? If one of your friends starts posting mean things about another person, would you do anything? So having these types of scenarios discuss, discussed with them. Uh, the other thing is, as parents and community, realize that social networking sites, Facebook, for instance, has a age limit, 13. If you are under 13, or a child under 13 wants to establish Facebook, absolutely not. You're not ready for it. And then as parents, more parent tips. Monitor social networking postings. <clears throat> as parents, be aware that kids, if they're smart, have two pages, the real page and their parent page. The parent page, when you say, let me see your Facebook page, oh, sure, mom, sure, dad, their, pa their, their parent page has them singing in the choir, has them holding puppies and kittens and doing all this stuff. Their real page may have the alcohol, the drugs, the language issues out there. So be aware as a parent, there may be two pages that these kids have. It could be two different, it, absolutely, good point. It could be two different social network media. So it could be a Facebook and an Instagram. You know, uh, for me, it is almost a case-by-case -case basis. I, I, I think that 13 is a good place to start. Uh, but if you're 13, if you're 14 or 15, and I feel that, you know what, you don't have the skills to be on there, then no. But if you're 12 and you have great, you have a, a great decision-making, you have great friends, you know what you're doing, uh, you're not going to just friend everybody, then sure, I might consider, consider it under 13. So for me, it's almost a kind of a parent should be able to judge their children and say, do you have the social emotional skills? Uh, can I trust you online issue? Um, I think the other issue is this issue with cell phones and smartphones, you have to think of this thing. This smartphone that we're giving more and more of our kids and we're beginning to see smartphones coming into elementary school, this is the most powerful portable tool ever created. 
It is a phone. It is, you can text, you can email, you can take pictures, you can send pictures, you can take videos, you can send videos, you can get online. And we're putting them in the hands of young people who are, whose brains are not fully developed. The last place, and as you guys know this, the last part of the brain to develop is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is involved with moral reasoning. Well, I like to think of the frontal cortex as the brakes. It's that issue that when you're a teenager and somebody says, let's do this. Oh, yeah, let's do it. It's cool. You don't think of the consequences. As an adult, if someone says, let's do this, and you think, well, wait a minute, what are the consequences? Ah, no, let's not do that. Or you go ahead and go do it. I'm not going to do it. Kids have no breaks, and we put this tool in their hands. So they take videos, and they post it up, and they do crazy things like sexting and distribute those pictures. I think we've got have to get back to this point where it's empowerment versus entitlement. Kids are not entitled to a cell phone. They have to earn it. Again, I think these tips should be good on any city and district web page as well. Uh, and a great tip, have children check in cell phones 7 o'clock. That's my time, 7 o'clock. Give me the cell phone. It's going to be charged up on the kitchen counter. It is not going into your room because you have connection with the Internet and all your friends and all the other stuff, so I, that's how we're getting 2 o'clock in the morning postings. No, check it in and check it out. It would be a great, great tip. Other parent tips. If your kids are being cyberbullied, do not erase, omit, alter. All these things are your evidence. Do screenshots. And, in fact, if you're a parent out here and you're thinking, well, uh, my kid has been cyberbullied and I don't know how to do a screenshot, just write down screenshot and then you can do a Google for how to do a screenshot and it will, that, there will be a tutorial that will teach you how to do a screenshot with your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device or your home computer. Screenshot is just a photo of uh, what's on the screen at that point. So if somebody comes to me and says my kid is being cyberbullied, I want to see the print, the, the print screen. Show me the screen if I can't get to the site. Other issues, teaching netiquette. Netiquette is online manners. And I think here's the problem is as parents, most of us have taught etiquette. Technology has surpassed our ability to parent because now kids are bombing on each other online. As parents, we are not teaching netiquette or online citizenship, digital citizenship. I think that this new group of kids coming up, as they have kids, they will teach digital citizenship as much as we teach etiquette. But until that time, we have to remind parents, teach this, teach etiquette. Let me jump here. I'm not going to get into this stuff. I want to technology and internet risks. Uh, and by the way, the big challenge I had is an hour. I've never, I haven't spoken for just an hour in, in years. It um, takes me an hour to get warmed up. Technology and youth. So we're talking, and you know, we take a look at computers, gaming, internet, social networking, instant messaging technology, media influence then and now. Back then it was Pong. Remember, remember Pong? And in fact, I don't even know where they get the color screenshot of this Pong game. When I played, it was just the, that gray and white screen. And then asteroids came out, and you actually got to shoot things, and that was so cool. It's like, wow. We have to remember that um, violence was in games back in 1976. Death Race came out. And in Death Race, you got to run over pedestrians, and you got points for it. But there was a big difference in graphics. In 1980s, computers changed, processors changed, and games became more, more and more graphic. And you could see Mortal Kombat was one of the first blood and guts fighting games in which you could rip at some point a person's skull and spine from their body. And today it's about first-person shooter. You don't get to see the person on the end of the rifle because you are the person at the end of the rifle. It's not a character. It's you carrying out an attack and shooting. And that begins to desensitize what's going on with kids. Bully is another video game that's out there. Social networking and media sites. And you can see all this stuff up there. But right now, as I said, Instagram is the big one. Snapchat is the other big one. The internet and delinquency. Um, if I do a search, as I said, for fights, and remember, that, remember I picked Riverside just because no one from Riverside was represented. But this is what's being posted up.
I live this way. Listen. Kids. Kids walking home from school. That's on. The level of violence and the fights have increased because of the issue of I can upload it now. I'm famous. And if I get beat down, the only way I get to say, oh, let me go back. In the old days, if I lost a fight, in my day, if I lost a fight, everybody remembers it for about a week or two weeks until the next person gets beat up. And then you go on with your life. Today, it's online and it's there forever. It goes on and on and on and on. And the only way I can save face now, my reputation, is if I beat someone else down and post it up. So the level of violence goes up. And if you watch this video again, kids knew that a fight was happening. Somebody walks up behind somebody and slugs them in the head while some, another person is videotaping it. Uh, uh, Shamawa Middle School. When, uh, <clears throat> when I was in middle school, I, I went to Arizona Intermediate in the Alvord District, and uh, they beat us in basketball. I, I swore I would get even with them one day. <laughs> I'm <j> joking. <laughs> girls, girls in fights. I'm starting this shit now. Fuck all that shit. What happened to sugar and spice and everything nice? It's all about being online. So we see girl fights happening. We see fights in, at every stage and er every grade level uh, being posted up. And the uh, internet as a delinquency tool. Remember I said you can learn drugs. Well, you can learn how to pick locks. Don't too. open the combination to a lock. I just want to impress your friends with your hacking skills. Well, I'll be showing you one of the easiest ways to hack a lock. Soda can? Yeah. Begin by getting an empty soda can. Cut out the top of the can, then proceed by trimming out a small rectangular piece. Once you cut the rectangular piece out, trim an M-like shape on one side like so. When trimmed, it should look something like this. Then just fold the outer parts upward and the upper part downward like so. Once this part is done, it should look something like this. Now let's hack some locks. To hack the lock open, put the shimmer to the left side of the lock and wrap it around the pole. Then just pull the loop of the lock upward while pushing the shim downward into the slot. Here's a close-up video of the demonstration. Again, just push the shim downward and pull the lock upward both at the same time. Here it is again. An easier way of doing it is to push the shim downward into the slot first, then pull the lock up. And there you have it. Now you're ready to hack open some locks. That's how I lost my gym clothes. Mm -hmm. So, so delinquency can be spread by just a few keystrokes, just a search. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to be open and honest. If I were a 13-year-old boy today and I saw this video, 
I would try this. Now, I'm not a thief. I wouldn't have stolen anything from anyone's locker, but I think actually I more, was more of a class clown. And I think the funny thing to do would have been to break into two of my friend's lockers switch and the trade locks. their underwear. Or switch the locks. It would just be, I think, would just be hilarious. Uh, but that, again, I was a class clown. So the thing is, though, is that online, and what's not said online, is that once you trim that M-like shape and you make that tool, you have a burglary tool and you can be arrested for it. And that isn't out there. And we have kids with no brakes who say, hey, that looks cool, let's do it, who can get into a lot of trouble. I'm not going to show the bomb one on here, the dry ice bomb, but pornography. Uh, porn is online and free online. And, and by porn, I mean anything and everything you can imagine is online. I'm giving you all the bad news stuff first, and then we're going to talk about strategies. Um, if I was a parent today with middle school aged children, especially boys, but girls are getting involved with looking at porn as much as boys now, um, I'd be scared because of the stuff that's out there. And I would think about, well, maybe I should get net nanny or something like that. Um, any of you in here have at home a parent block on your uh, either computer or your uh, satellite TV, cable TV? Whatever you have, or your cell phones, whatever you have, tonight go home, and if it's NetNanny, WebSense, any of these things, do a Google search, NetNanny cheats, and you will find directions on how to override the parental block for anything, for Verizon phones, for anything that you have, for your cable box. It will give kids the instructions to do it. So don't think, well, that's going to save me because kids will find a way to get around it. The other issue with this is as we block these sites from kids, they go to what's called proxy sites. A proxy site is a third, uh, the best way to put it is a proxy site is a site, a server somewhere else that kids can log into, go to that search engine on that site, go around the parental block and get anything they want. The problem is a lot of these, these third party sites, these proxy sites, are set up in countries overseas that are known for fraud and crime. So you're giving these people access to your whole computer. If your children are surfing from the computer that you have your tax records on, these individuals will have your social security numbers. They will have your bank account numbers from a child going to a proxy site. How do you find proxy sites? Just do a search. Proxy search engines, proxy sites. And it'll take you to all the different sites that you can go to, or you shouldn't go to, because, again, they'll steal your information. Um, but if you take a look at the issue of porn, porn online, free porn online, other than the suggestive lips there, it says enter or exit. That's it. It says by entering, you're saying that you're over 18. Now, I know as a 13-year-old boy, if I hit this and it said, oh, I have to be 18, darn, I'm not going to go into that site. I'll wait five years and go take a look at it. There are no checks and balances. Kids are getting in there. Let me come back to this. Drugs. Drugs are out there. How to make drugs from household chemicals. We talked about these issues, salvia divinorum, K2, spice, gold. Uh, drug website in 2009. Uh, came up with uh, 85,700,000 different websites that had, uh, had anything to do with making drugs. In 2010, the same search, 92 million websites. Just did this the other day, and I came up with 481 million websites. So there are, and not all of these sites tell you how to make drugs. Some are advertisements and some are anti-drug. But the problem is, is that a lot of the sites do tell you how to take household chemicals and get high off of them. So even if I'm not a druggie and I start hitting some of these sites, I can take a look at what I can make and I'll do it. Uh, best way to get high, just did this search. The best way to get high thinking, what would a bored kid search for? The best way to get high. And um, I found one on here that, the gravity bong. Any of you heard of a gravity bong? 
I hadn't heard of a gravity bong either, but uh, gravity bong supposedly concentrates the smoke and allows you to inhale it and get higher. Uh, so then I thought, well, how do I make a gravity bomb? And there are instructions online how to make gravity bong. There are videos online on how to make a gravity bong. You guys are drunken gummy bears. All this stuff is online. It's just a few keystrokes away. Instant messaging and texting. Kids do a lot of IMing. They don't, kids, by the way, don't do emails. You know, for adults, the height of our technological ability is I can email. I can get them. I can send them. I can attach files. I can attach pictures. I can send them out. I can send them to multiple people. Now, uh, be truthful. That first time that that email got kicked back to you, it was undeliverable, and you thought, I wonder if I put enough postage on there. Do I put postage on there? Does it, I don't, how does this happen, right? Kids don't do that. It's all about instant messaging or texting. Instant messaging is I know someone is online and ready to talk. So there'll be that icon that says that some of my best friends are out and online. And so I can I am them. If they don't respond, now I'm great at, I, if I don't feel like responding, I don't respond. That's why I don't instant message, because people will know I'm online and should respond. Uh, if they text me, it's, they don't know if I'm online or not. And by the way, I am a texter, emailer. I'm not a good phone person. You know, we're now in that communication area where people are asking, what's your favorite mode of communication? Well, mine is texting, and, and you know, I, don't, I don't really pick up the phone too often. Uh, let's jump here. How about another quiz? Anybody? Can anyone pick out anything over this? Let's do an easy one. POS. Yeah, yeah. Not not P. That's the old school piece of yeah. stuff. That's old school. That's uh the that's an easy one. It's parents over shoulder. If you are a child and you are texting, instant messaging a friend or others, and your parent walks in, you just put down POS meaning parent over shoulder. And other people will know, oh, I need to clean it up. Now, there are some really scary ones on here. Um, LMIR is one of them. Let's meet in real life. Kids will get into chat rooms. Let's meet in real life. And you can see some of the other pretty bad ones on there. But this is how kids communicate. These are how sexual predators communicate with your kids, our kids online. Sexting, taking that provocative digital image of yourself and sending that image to friends. Both males and females do this. And we used to think it was just kind of a kid thing. Adults do it too now. As you guys, as we are aware from some of the news, news issues. This is what I'd like to tell you is that oh, our oh, girls yeah. think that if I am in competition with a boy, I need to send them a picture of myself because the other girl's going to do it and he's going to like her more. So girls begin sending pictures of themselves out. And they think, well, he loves me, and he won't show it to someone else. Mm -mm. Boys will share those pictures. And I think part of that discussion as a parent is having talks with your girls and boys about this issue of sexting. Because once that digital image is out there, there's no taking it back. If somebody's downloaded it, it will pop up again and again and again and again. Let's jump here. Chat rooms. We've talked a little bit about chat rooms. Chat room is a great, chat rooms are great, by the way. Chat rooms are fantastic for what they're intended to be. Uh, I like working on cars. I have a 1970 Dodge Challenger sitting in a garage waiting for the day I retire so that I can start working on it again. I've already rebuilt it, the engine. I have a 383 Magnum, and I know this is completely foreign to some of you out there. Uh, but if I were taking a look at, hey, how do I do this? I want to rebuild my Holly 850 CFM double pump carburetor. How do I do it? I can get into a chat room with other gearheads, as they're called, and I can say, hey, anyone, can anyone tell me how to rebuild a carburetor? And just I just put my carburetor out there, and I will get instructions, and chats back, and tips, and everything from this community. So it's an awesome idea, except for when it comes to kids because predators are out there. So I can do a search for popular teen chat rooms. Uh, there is a, there's one teen spot. This is the one that Paul Johnson usually gets in, into live when we do our parent trainings. And there's no checks. You just get in there and you, be, and you just say who, who you are, 
and you can start chatting. I hope I pulled the, I think I deleted the, yes, whoo, good thing, wow. Uh, the, the chat that he was in, I have in there for uh, when we do law enforcement trainings together. But immediately, there will be propositions to him. Now, Paul goes in there and he poses as a 12, 13-year-old girl just getting in and trying to be bored. And immediately, you could tell these pedophiles are hitting him. Ooh. One in particular was model agent. Now, what 12, 13-year-old girl doesn't think about becoming a model someday? So model agent's in there and says, and says to Paul, doesn't know that Paul is a, what, 40-year-old uh, police officer, thinks he's a 12-year-old girl. Um, well, have you ever thought about a career in modeling? And so Paul says yes. And, of course, what's the next question then from the guy? Send, yeah, send me some pictures so I can assess what you look like. If Paul sent in a picture, the next one would be, no, no, you have to take off your clothes and send a picture. This, this is how these guys operate online. So one of the biggest things that as a parent or communities, we need to talk about chat rooms. And we basically, we need to tell kids, stay out of chat rooms. You do not know who you're talking to. Uh, there's chat roulette. This is one of my favorites. Uh, um, chat roulette is you sign up for chat roulette. You can have your camera on. Your camera has your picture and a picture of a stranger. So what happens is like a roulette wheel, a random picture pops up, and you can engage that person in a discussion, or you can reject that person and go to the next person. So there's a guy in there who dresses in a cat suit. And this is actually kind of funny. He's, he doesn't do anything but kind of sit there. So, so you can see the kid on the bottom. That's his screen. And he's looking at it, and, and he's like, WTF, and you guys all know what WTF is now. Uh, are you? And the guy says, a cat. And so his response is, just, he can't respond. He's just got dot, 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 dot. What do, he, what do I do with this? <laughs> so it can be fun, but it's dangerous, too, because kids are being connected to strangers, to individuals they do not know. I always ask parents, would you allow a complete stranger to come into your child's bedroom and talk to them face-to-face -face about anything that they wanted to without you being present? Absolutely not. Well, guess what? If they have Internet in their rooms, by default, you're allowing them to do it. If they're playing video games online, by default, you're allowing strangers to come into their lives and engage and talk to them. So big question. If I were in a chat room, or if a kid was in a chat room, would they answer any of those four questions if they thought they were talking to somebody of the same age? Absolutely. What's your name? Wayne Sakamoto. Where do you live? Well, I live in Temecula. Where do you go to school? Uh, I won't pick a school. But what are your parents' names? Uh, my, my, my dad's name is Jim. He, you know, my dad works, my dad also works in Temecula. Uh, he, he might know your father. Give me the full name. And from that, I can go to different search engines and find the exact house. In fact, if you'd like to, do a search on yourself. Go to Zaba Search. And if you're in Zaba Search, you can go in zabasearch.com, type in your name in California, and you might find that not only does your information pop up, but your house will pop up. It's scary stuff. So as a pedophile, if I wanted to find out and get information from a kid, I'd plug them into Zaba Search or People Search or One Two Three People Search or any of these other people search engines, and I'll find out where they live. Okay, so let's talk about general strategies. My time's kind of running down here. A layered approach as parents, and again, my, I would hope that as cities and communities and schools, we can get parent tips up online for our parents, for our community. A layered approach to safety and security. So other than just having Net Nanny or any of the other keystroke counting programs, having discussions with our kids, limiting their access, sitting with them as they surf, not allowing them to ha go to chat rooms, checking in cell phones. Those are, that's a layered approach, multiple approaches. Trust kids, we trust our kids, but trust only goes so far. I want to keep you safe. Never believe not my kid. My kid would never get in the chat room and give out information about themselves. Every kid is vulnerable. 
Here's the other big game that, that um, pedophiles play. They go into a chat room and they start chatting. Let's say it's a, a cheerleading chat room. Get the pedophile will get into a cheerleading chat room, and again, 40, 50 year old guy in a cheerleading chat room, posing as a college cheerleader, knowing that in this chat room there are going to be a lot of middle school and high school cheerleaders. Well, college cheerleader at USC, wow. They start connecting with the girls. And it could be as simple as, hey, uh, in a chat room, hey, um, anybody, ha anybody having problems with their parents? Anybody having problems with their mom? Anybody having problems with their stepmom? Now, if you've raised kids, you know that there are going to be problems. And kids blow these problems way out of proportion. And they think, oh, it's devastating. It's the end of the world. So yeah, I'm having problems with my stepmom. You know, I did too. I was having a terrible time. And now the chat starts. The male has to somehow get switched from a female into who he is. And this is the bait and switch. It's when I was, you know, I used to, when I lived at home, I had problems with my stepmom too. But you know, there's a guy I met who was really great and helped talk me through it. It sounds like you have some, some tremendous things going on, and I can tell you, this guy can help you. Would you mind if I, would you, would you like to talk to him? Well, yeah, sure, since uh, you're my friend in the chat room and we're connecting. Yeah, okay, give me your email address and we'll start emailing. And I pull that person out of the chat room, start emailing them individually, and now the switch. Well, here's this, here's this guy. And so the pedophile now can say, yeah, it's me. Well, yeah, you have some problems. Why don't we just go ahead and meet in person? And it's as easy as that. Our naive kids are innocent kids who believe that they have connected with somebody online who doesn't exist, is now connected directly to a pedophile. We have to arm kids with the information, but as parents, we also have to take a look at where they're at and what they're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Have ongoing discussions with children on the internet. Have children sign contracts. Discuss scenarios as we talked about. This is a great one. Have kids research cyberbullying themselves or bullying. Have them take a look at what's going on online. Have them develop something and come back and report. This helps develop their own skills. Have them research internet safety online, where they can, have, they can actually talk to individuals or see stories about individuals who've either been abducted or almost abducted because they got into chat rooms. Secure, secure computers in a family room. I would not have computers with internet access in individual kids' rooms today. There's just too many things going on. You can use tracking or screening software, but again, remember proxy sites and the cheats we talked about. I can get around any of the tracking screening software that you might have. And you can see the rest, check web history, check cell phone files. Uh, I am gonna jump here to this stuff. There, this is Xbox. So on Xbox, here are the d directions, instructions on how to get around the parental block on Xbox. I can do it, find them for, as I said, anything. Uh, Net Nanny Hack. And it'll give me all the directions around Net Nanny. Like I said, if you have a screening software on your computer or your cable satellite box, do a Google search to see if you can hack around it. See if, you, if those instructions are out there. There are, are YouTube videos, instructional videos on how to do it. So not only do you get the written, you'll have an instructional video. If any, is, have is anyone used YouTube video, instructional videos to do anything around the house? <laughs> I have, you know, it's a, how do I change the trap in my kitchen sink? And it's right out there. Great instructional videos. Same type of high quality videos teaching kids how to get around the internet, how to get around any of the screening mechanisms that you might have. Talked a little bit about them, this, limit, eliminate chat rooms. Kids are gonna be on social networking sites. Um, I don't think we're gonna ever be able to say kids don't stay off of them. How do you safely get on an internet, uh, a social networking site? Teach them how to do the screenshots. For those of you with uh, PCs, this is how you do a screenshot. But like I said, do a Google search or Bing search or whatever your search engine is for screenshots. 
privacy issues are huge. Tell your, talk to your kids about privacy. Only add real friends that they know. Don't add, and you guys know the game. It's kids will add friends because they want to see those high numbers. And now we're at Instagram followers, how many followers that I have. And I like Instagram because, wow, followers, isn't that like paparazzi? Isn't that, does that make me like a movie star if I have followers? So Instagram makes it very popular to have a lot of followers. Give out your passwords to only, only your parents. We have had so many, uh, you know girls in the BFF issue, right? You're my best friend forever. Oh, I love you. No, I love you, right? And, oh, I love you so much. Here's my password to Facebook. Well, no, here's mine. And then what happens? The boy comes in. Something else happens. I hate you. You're not my BFF. I'm going to hate you forever now. You're my HFF. Right? But kids now have passwords. So you, one girl will get on another girl's website or Facebook site or whatever social networking site and change things, omit things, add things. It's incredible. Passwords should only be given to parents. That's it. Watch what you post. It's forever. I, I, saw, I saw a saying uh, the other day I think on Facebook. It was the... <laughs> yeah, I think it, I think it did come from you. <laughs> no, it was the um, I'm glad I did all my crazy stuff before before the internet. <laughs> exactly, because it'd be all up there. Uh, and I, I'll tell you that kids today, one of the most precious things they have is their personal image. And so, if people are taking pictures of them, you don't know where those images are going to go or how they'll be used. And we try to tell kids to guard what you do because it will post up there. Now, again, I'll make that admission. When I was a crazy, wild young man, I gave my friends the one-fingered salute. You guys know what that is, right? The one-fingered salute on camera as just being a guy, just having fun. Not anything mean, not anything vulgar, just we we're just knuckle-headed guys, and we did that. Well, back in my day, you didn't even get two pictures with your, with your, when you turned in your camera roll. You got one picture in the negatives. And nobody reprints the negatives when you're a kid, so you throw them all away. And the picture vanishes. Today, with digital images, it gets up there forever. And that's what kids have to know. Well, let's see. I think I'm just going to kind of just hit these last couple of things. Uh, remember to turn off electronics. Give yourself a break. Our kids are always plugged in. And when you take a look at our young people today, they don't have reflective, quiet time. They have that their earbuds in. They're listening to music. Um, they're on their cell phones. But then again, we're on our cell phones all the time, too. I think at some point, we all have to take an electronic break, shut it down, take a reflective moment, and just have these things off. But we keep them on and on and on and texting and emailing and all this other stuff late into the night. We have to give ourselves a break. Kids have to give themselves a break as well. important is that it's happening in every city in the nation. We're not immune. This stuff, this technology stuff, cyberbullying, the delinquency spread on, online, the fights posted up online is happening in every city in the nation. Um, developing a task force to address the issues. If we're taking a look at youth behavior issues, we have to take a systematic approach uh, about doing this. Developing a task force in each city to take a look at what's going on in our area, what are our resources, what can we do about it. Developing partnerships with schools, community-based, faith-based, law enforcement, et cetera. Um, a youth development strengthening families approach. It really has to be this issue of developing capable young people, as H. Stephen Glenn said. And the research is clear. There are developmental competencies that if we teach our children to be competent in seven areas, this is strong research, they'll be less likely to be involved in alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, uh, violence, gangs, any of these things that impact every one of our cities. Developing that comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan should fit the medical model. And that medical model was primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. 
that means that we need to take a look at how do we how can we prevent it and if we we know we can prevent it for most of our young people but some people some of our young people are going to cyberbully they are going to be involved in violence what interventions do we have in place as well so this is what it's about and i think this is what we're, this has to happen if we're serious about addressing our young people and the risks that are out there via online via video games or whatever it might be is taking a comprehensive approach and taking a youth development approach. I want to thank you guys for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to entertain those. Doctor, thanks for a, uh, an excellent presentation. I'm almost certain we're going to have comments and questions. So um, I'll tell you what, why don't we start at the other end? Go ahead, Crystal, you look like you're ready to rock and roll. I now. am ready to rock and roll. This is exactly what I've been looking for for this council. This is strategies that parents can use that make sense and can make a huge impact on, on children's lives. I really would like for you to put together a list, including the cell phones on the counter at 7 p.m. That's brilliant. That's something simple that a parent can use to help stop some of this bullying. It's, it's a, a awesome. You did an awesome job, and, and I'd like for you to provide that list with us, including that, that thing, because that's something we could put up on our websites. I think that's brilliant. Thanks very much, and, and would I work through Melissa to get her the list? Is that the process? Melissa and Betsy. Betsy. Okay. Melissa and Betsy, either one. <laughs> what do you keep, either every one. time I look at you, you duck or you move. I mean, I, I, what, what's going on with that? Crystal, thank you, thank you. And anything else? I was <clears throat> prepared tonight to say that by the time we get to this end, they all ask the same questions already. Mm. Uh, very good presentation, Doctor. Very good. Uh, my only question would be: Is are we going to have access to this slide presentation or something abbreviated or something? Would be great. Okay, uh, absolutely. And first of all, no, no doctoral. Um, so just, just Wayne is good as well. Thank you. Wayne. Um, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, and I get Betsy. Um, I guess I do. What I what did you mean though the actual PowerPoint he yes. presented or some kind of abbreviated version of this would be really handy. Yeah, I I think I can work through Betsy to get her the excellent. Thank you, yeah. Julio. Thank you, Mr. Sakamoto, for being here today. And um, one of the things is that we don't always have to start from scratch. And I think you know this task force is uh, starting uh, to bridge the gaps among the cities. But I think if you have the information. Uh, of other cities doing local task forces, that task forces locally that we could kind of mimic and uh, and see what they're doing locally, so that we can uh, ourselves uh, take it back and work together with our school districts. Our city alone has three school districts within mm -hmm. its city boundaries, and so um, so we can kind of see what other cities are doing at the very local level, and so that we can kind of see if that works for our cities themselves. So if you have that contact information of of any municipalities that are doing that, uh, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Chris? Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> I am so proud and happy that Wayne is with our district and, and the contributions he has made uh, for the student safety and um, you know, parent education in our district has been you know, immeasurable. And through my job, I, I do have an opportunity to go around to other school districts and there are schools that I am able to walk right on the campus. Mm -hmm. There's no security. And, and if I can walk right on the campus, anyone can. And, and that's just an example of one of the, um, you know, the, the, the concepts that Wayne has brought to our district is that safety, that basic safety for our students. And so, you know, I would encourage the other school districts here, to, if you don't have someone with like Wayne in your district, that that's certainly a position that I think is really, really important because if our kids aren't safe, you know, that's really the foundation for everything. Thanks. Is to have, and he's Thanks, Chris. been, you know, such an asset to our district. So thank you well, thank for you. sharing your information with everyone. Welcome, Ellen. No questions, just a comment, and uh, you have every right to be proud. That was extraordinary, Wayne. Uh, very, very informative. Um, what I, I like and I, I want to point out to the residents of Marietta and wh whoever else may watch this video is this is a topic where I can see the potential problems that exist on the, the cyber world. However, I, I didn't have any strategy to address it and you connected the dots for me tonight. So I appreciate that. We need to get this information 
out to as many people as we can. It goes beyond the, cyber, the bullying aspect. Um, I, I think it's a, a school safety in my, my day job um, with Homeland Security. One of the, the biggest issues we have right now is cyber terrorism. Mm -hmm. And we can prevent people from getting on campus, but through the internet, they have 24 seven access to our children, to our community, to our businesses. It's a huge issue and, and we need to address it. And this is a good start. So thank you. Thank you. Rick. <clears throat> Wayne, I, I guess I would begin by saying uh, nothing you said surprises me. But the sheer magnitude of the threat to our kids is just astounding. So <clears throat> from the perspective of a community leader for all of our communities, I look at you and I know that you have a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and you and the Marietta Police Department are really close. But how do you bring in the parents? You know, when you look at Marietta and Temecula, just as examples, two thirds of our parents are on the road commuting long distances to their jobs. And the last thing that they wanna hear when I get home is that uh, <clears throat> the kid wants to do something and it, it's gonna be, well, you know, just go play a video game or something like that. You know, get on your computer and do something. Thinking that that's the babysitter and in right. reality, the babysitter is also the kidnapper as well right. because there's such a big threat. So, you know, f for this task force and if there are task forces that are for our individual cities, it really becomes, wow, how do you go about getting the cooperation you need from the folks who ought to be the closest to the problem, and that's the parents, but in many cases, they're kind of oblivious to the real threat that's posed by that great tool that we all have called the internet. Yep, I, I think, uh, sir, you hit the, the key issue that as we take a look at either drugs or gangs or either violence, things that we've dealt with is how do we get parents to the table? And that is a key issue. That I, I can tell you that as a school district, we continually have parent nights. Uh, and I'll also tell you that we continually deal with the eight to 10 parents whose kids are great and fantastic and they're great and fantastic because their parents are at every single event. It becomes how do we outreach? Well, we continue to outreach. And as you're saying that, I think that we also have to think out of the box because I was one of those individuals that commuted from San Diego to Temecula for 16 years. And the last thing that I wanted to do when I rolled into my house at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night um, after going through that commute was to come to a community meeting. I would say that we have to take a layered approach. We need to have the community meetings, and it doesn't have to be at a school site. It could be at a city council chamber. It could be at a faith-based institution. It could be on a Sunday at a faith-based institution where you're getting a larger segment of people who might not be um, at a school site. Uh, but also that layered approach could be things that you're doing here, videotaping the event and having it available for the community. And we can even go further outside the box and maybe even doing a podcast type of event where it's, it's an audio book where parents who are on that commute can listen to something, information. Um, yeah. Would they? I, I would say that a small percentage would, but we'd be doing our jobs by having a layered approach, by having community forums, by having school district presentations, by having presentations in the community, by having webcasts put out, and by uh, getting it out audio-wise, either computer or, as I said, just being able to have somebody download it into their iPad and plug it into their car and listen to it on the way home. So. Thank you. A couple of comments. Um, maybe they're rhetorical or if you can respond to them, I don't know. You, some of the things that you, sh you showed regarding the uh, cyberbullying portion, of course, then the fight portion, and I asked myself the question while you were showing it, how on earth can a child function? How, how can anybody get through their day? It is almost like there is a, um, uh, you know, the word terrorism is, is or, or terror is a little overused these days. It's used for everything. Maybe we need a new word. But literally, if, if, if this is always in play, the amount of energy and the amount of fear that goes into I, I, gosh, let me just melt into being a fly on the wall. Let me not do anything. Let me not say anything. Please don't notice me. Or, or, you know, how do you function? How does a child function in this environment where uh, just on anybody's whim, they can be singled out 
and off you go and there's no turning back and for no reason. Any response to that? The, the only response that I have is, first of all, I agree with you. The pressure that our technology has, has brought to these at-risk issues uh, is tremendous. And to be a kid today and to be videotaped in any way or be baited into a video uh, and then having it uploaded would be humiliating. It would be hard to get over. Um, that being said, uh, when I talk to our kids about does this add stress or pressure to you, for them it's the norm. This is every day for us. We grew up with this technology. So for us as adults, we look at it and think, well, it's a huge stressor. But our kids say, this is our every day. You know, I have a 21-year-old uh, daughter. But I remember when she was in middle school, going to the local middle school here, and I'd drive her. Um, it was very interesting. Every time we turned a certain corner, about a quarter mile away from the school, she would complain of stomach aches. Every day, it was unusual, and, and finally we pinned it down, and, and uh, um, we really uncovered the MySpace culture at the time, and, and I don't go into a whole bunch of detail, but that's uh, what was causing everything, and of course, when we fixed that, the stomach aches went away, but it was, it was just uh, uh, anxiety, intenseness, and pressure, as you said. Um, a couple other comments. Uh, and, and I, again, these are rhetorical. I say it for the benefit of my colleagues up here because I have the question. When we can, or our children, can dial up anything on the internet when it relates to porn and take that as far as they want to take it, and get a suggestion from their friends, look at things that may be to some silly but secretly sexually stimulating, it's safe to say that that has to play itself out at some point. Is, is that a safe s statement that, that the end result of that has to be leading somewhere? I would agree. Any, any information or knowledge of that, that, that that type of ability leads to something else? Have you, have you done any research in, in that regard? It seems uh, obvious, uh, but in this day and age, people want facts and figures. I mean, I can honestly tell you, you know, if you're looking at uh, uh, just naked pictures, that leads to something else, which leads to something. I, that seems gateway drug. That, yeah. Yes, exactly. That seems logical to me. But have we proven that? Has that is that substantiated? There, there is some really good research on uh, as we've talked tonight about some of the hip hop culture as well as pornography. There is some really good research out that does show that children who are subjected to hip hop, to pornography, to some of these other at risk factors are at greater chance to succumbing to uh, greater risk of early sex sexual experimentation, um, fascination, fixation with some of the sex issues. I'll also tell you that there is some good research, we've talked a little bit about it, uh, in the pornography area. In the past, pornography has primarily been a male domain. Uh, and it's primarily been a male domain because, well, research says that males are more visual. But it's been a male domain because there, there's a social stigma for a female to go into that liquor store and to purchase that magazine or to go to the adult bookstore at the edge of town and the worst places that you can imagine and walk in. With it being online, the new research is showing that girls are becoming as addicted to pornography as males because it's easy access and there is no stigma to actually walking into a physical store or putting yourself in danger in a dangerous part of town to purchase this. So I, I think there's this strong research that's out there, sir. Two more things, uh, mostly uh, um, directed at my staff. I see our director of community service there, uh, Kevin Hawkins. Wave, Kevin. And of course, Betsy. Betsy's here. Um, Kevin, could you get with Mayor Pro Tem, Marianne Edwards, and I, and let's talk about forming a local task force? Um, because I, I think that's just a fantastic idea. And I think that local task force needs to include our community leaders and parents and things of that nature. Now, Wayne, if we, t two questions for you. If we form such a task force, would you be willing, can you come be willing to educate that task force and send it in the proper direction? I, the, our school district has been very supportive of us uh, assisting on a regional basis. I have, okay. I have no doubt that. Okay, be very to good. And then, then my second or last question and related question is you, you work for the school district, is that it? That's correct. Um, and I think, uh, Kevin and Betsy, the, the, we need to uh, have this information in the hands of our citizens. We always 
have this whole task force internally, um, we've been discussing um, just everything we're talking, how do we get it into the hands of parents? And I remember we were talking, uh, Melissa, you were part of that as well, and Betsy, the schools always seem to be the best place to, to mechanism because that's where all the kids are. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at laws and you start looking at privacy and what we can do in the schools and what we can, it sort of seems to be real prohibitive to get information in the school. And I gotta praise you guys out in Marietta for being able to, to bridge that gap. Um, however, we, Kevin, we need to take the lead and maybe do a uh, community service class or something of that nature, get the word out to our entire community. And do you prefer, Wayne, to have families here or just parents? Would you like the children with their parents here, parents alone or children alone? What's for, the best way? For this presentation, it was better not to have kids. Right. But right. There, there are versions where it is more of the family, and especially taking a, youth, a look at that youth development approach of having families but here I together. Would, now, knowing that your, your time is valuable and we can't expect the school, uh, Myriad School District to pay for your time, if we covered your time in some way, can, would you be willing to come here and at least launch us and get a counterpart going here in Temecula? Well, I, I would have to check with our superintendent, but again, I think we've been very supportive. Uh, our superintendent has been very supportive of, of lending me out, I, I guess is the, <laughs> the best way to put it. So, so Kevin, over there in the back, two things. Forming a local task force and also setting up some sort of community service event um, and see if Mr. Sakamoto and the Murrieta School District will, will release him to come work with us. And I'll tell you what, we'll trade Yvette for a day, okay? <laughs> we'll trade one Yvette Martinez for, a, for a, a Wayne Sakamoto. How's that? Okay. And maybe if, if you really deal heavily, we'll give you Betsy for an hour, okay? How's that? It's a loan, <laughs> though. Is it's that a loan. It okay. <laughs> Can we get a future round draft choice with that? Or? <laughs> well, yeah, you know. <laughs> I got a Betsy Lowry rookie card. Okay. Right. <laughs> Is it autographed? <laughs> no, listen, thank you for a, a great presentation. Um, Mayor Potemid. If we could go to Mr. Benoit and yes. then come back to me because he has a meeting. So. Absolutely. Well, actually, go what I have is I'm going to go help deal with my daughter on bullying the old way, which is she's going to Taekwondo class in a minute. So that's, the, you know, it seems to be that's the old way to help out. You know, and not that she has an issue with it or anything, but that's just, you know, the old way of doing stuff like that. But. Anyway, my question is along the lines of, you mentioned a few times in your presentation, contracts. And I was curious, are those contracts available online? My guess is you're going to say Google it, and I'm sure no, it's there. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I have a, you, if you do Google it, you'll yeah. find it, but I'll give you the best site out there. It's uh, bully, cyberbullying.us. Okay, and, and uh, I'm sure that'll be part of our, our information that comes yeah. back to and, us. And uh, you'll find that this website is put together by Samir Hindaju and Justin Patchen. Uh, they, when they were in Wisconsin, one was criminal justice and the other was a technology guru. And, and at that time, they said that our biggest challenge in schools is going to be the issue of cyberbullying technology. So they teamed up. They have everything that you can imagine on that website from scenario discussions with parents to contracts for Internet use and contracts for cell phone use. So Great. Make sure that we get that to you. I'm going to be looking into that. And I'm also going to go and uh, my daughter's uh, new iPod Touch will have a bed with a cell phone charger in the kitchen. That's a great idea. And perfect. I think uh, having that bedtime for the phone is perfect. So thank you. And thank I you. Run. Thank you. Good to see you. Bridget? Oh, oh, did you want to come back? I thought we're skipping you now. Feel my time back in your hand. Oh, okay. Got <laughs> Miss you. Edwards. Um, Excellent, and I, I think there are a number of ways that we can get this into the hands of the community, not just in a, a passive way, and I hate to use that term, but really when you put it up on, an, on a website, that is a passive way, and it takes an initiative on the part of parents or family members or youth development organizations to go and see. But I think that there are a number of vehicles that we could use. Clearly, I can, I can, I can see something like this at Rancho Community Church as part of our family, family outreach. Uh, certainly the Boys and Girls Club. I would love to see what the version is that you would present to our Keystone Club, our teen members, of which there are do hundreds, and to our youngsters, our ele elementary school uh, youth, and we have thousands of them. So I would love to see us set something up with you. And mom, mom or dad, parents will be encouraged to come, to, to come along. But I think there are many, many vehicles that we could use in town if we... Uh, can contact them or um, make that outreach that you could post or actually go in person. And there's posting is one thing, but being there and having you do the presentation is completely another. So I would love to have you come to our four, go to all four of our clubs and talk to our kids. 
using the age appropriate. And especially, um, we have examples in our two cities where we are, our police also pose as uh, decoys online, and we've had a number of instances, one very public one that was in the paper within the last month or so, where um, someone that I happen to know, Melissa happens to know, was posing as a, a, a you know, a teenage, a teenager, and uh, it was stunning. Someone that we've known for hmm. 15 years, many, many years, absolutely stunning. So um, this was amazing and very eye-opening, and just a correction. I pulled up the um, salvia, whatever it is on here. Mine's a different kind. Oh, okay. So much. Yeah, so you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, I will add one other thing. I was a part of the whole slam book thing. I didn't produce them or make them or distribute them or pass them around, but I was in them through seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade at a time when you're a gawky looking kid anyway, and, and it's very, very hurtful. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine what <laughs> kids go through now, seeing that on a website where you know all your peers are seeing. Well, I mean, I think every public official has an idea, and we're adults, and the same thing happens to us, and we know it's painful when it happens to you. Imagine if you're that insecure sixth, seventh, eighth grader. It's trying to fit in. And devastating. Yeah, yeah, so we've got to put a stop to that. Thank you. Bridget. I thought uh, your presentation was definitely an eye-opener. I'm a mother of a 16-year-old boy, so we have already encountered some of the things that were discussed. Uh, but I really appreciate all the information, and I think we're going to keep you busy because I'd love to have you come to Wildemar, too. So we'll work it out. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Thanks. Rita. Okay, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, it's um, early this morning, there was a prayer vigil that I held with some of the pastors in the city of Paris. And uh, one of the main items that we prayed for were our youth, the exposure to violence, the cyber bullying, um, and the peer pressure that they succumb to. And uh, we, the pastors, and we came together to, to pray for the youth. So it's fitting that I find out some more information. This is really great. I'd love to have the hard copies because I chair a cops and clergy network with over 30 some pastors in the city of Paris. Um, as a grandmother of nine, uh, many of the older grandchildren are on very various social media sites. So I went from Facebook and then they moved to Tumblr and I went there and the Twitter and now the Instagram, but um, I've tried to follow them so I can stay abreast on what they're doing, but now they come up with these different names. So now that I know I can go on Google, I'm gonna see if I can find out how to find your grandchildren's users' names oh. and see if I can fi find that out, so. Oh, you go, Grandma. Yeah, yeah, you have to start with your family, so. Mm -hmm. You know, we wanna make sure that I stay abreast to what they're doing and uh, <laughs> For a while, they let me post little cute things on their Facebook page, and then they said, oh, it's kind of embarrassing, Granny. So <laughs> I, I just listen now and just try to stay abreast of what they're doing. Well, but you know you're looking. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So um, it, it's very pressing on my heart. Um, the pastors, uh, we shared some instances about what was happening with the younger generation and what the, the, the children are experiencing because, um, you know, they haven't even begun to to realize life right. and they're taking on so many heavy burdens and it, it just kind of breaks your heart when they think the only outcome is either drugs or alcohol or even the ultimate which is suicide right. so what can we do to to reach out to these children what can we do to uplift them to let them know just that how much they're loved and how beautiful they are where they can't succumb to the evil thoughts or the peer pressures telling them they're ugly and they don't matter. So it, it's a great way to end a day that started in prayer. And uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you, Rita. Mary? Thank you. And thank you very much for your very, very excellent presentation. The problem that we have is getting the word out into the community. Uh, at, after our first meeting, I reported back at the city council meeting on TV, uh, and I said some pretty provocative things about uh, the addiction problem, the childhood addiction. I thought I'd get a couple of phone calls. Not a, not, no response. And why not? Because the young people don't watch the city council meetings. 
they're out playing or doing something else. They're not watching what's going on there, so they didn't get the message. So it's how to get it out and how, you know, they don't go on our website. We, we had a different kind of website where they could communicate people. Then people didn't bother. Uh, and so this is this is the problem. We do have a couple of um, citywide emails that are questionable sometimes, but that may be a place. <laughs> I don't know what how big a readership they have, but it may. But this is the problem of getting it out. But I will be looking for. I'm going to look for a way to dispense this information. We do have a junior women's club, so I can speak with them. Uh, uh, but uh, to get this information out to the younger people in our community, I'll be looking for that. So with this information you're going to provide it, I'm going to put stuff together for it. And so, and thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mary. Tim? Um, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And uh, I don't have any further comments. Thanks. Steve? Uh, thank you. A um, couple of additional points that I, I didn't see were mentioned, but um, on your Facebook page, the same uh, filters that are put forward to protect your privacy from other people can be utilized to isolate parents, family members from certain types of posts and activities and something that their uh, friends may be able to see. So uh, generally on mine, my family tends to be the one that has the most uh, uh, liberal ranking and then you know acquaintances and associates and then the public gets the least. The, the kids are different. They start with the friends <laughs> and then they exclude the family and the, and, and the people on the outside or the very outside of the ring. So sometimes you may actually see a Facebook page uh, or think that you're monitoring posts, but you're not. Right. And so that's important to note. Um, it's sad, you know, I, I've talked about this with friends, family members in the past. It seems like uh, our society has moved toward something ever since the Night Stalker was out, you know, where they keep the kids inside the house and then, um, you know, everybody's afraid to go outside and play and, and maybe learn those life lessons and, and, and face reality. Uh, and, and then you go online and, and the Internet is a cheap and easy way to uh, gain information and access uh, uh, other people, make friends from all over the world, uh, and you don't know who you're dealing with. You're 100% right. I thought your presentation was uh, right on the money, right on the spot. Um, some of this, I think, can be addressed. Um, I have concerns. Uh, I've, I've had uh, specific instances where, where this has climbed into my home, and uh, without going into details, bottom line is, is that um, there's not much that can be done. You know, except for to deal with your kids and try to have a conversation with them, try to educate them, try to uh, be a parent, and just like everything in life. And then eventually they become those turtles on the beach. You know, you hope they make it to the ocean and make it to open waters, but, um, you know, sometimes every so often you miss one or two. And um, so I'm looking forward to providing more information, uh, getting more of, the, more of those kids to safe harbor, hopefully getting, uh, getting along without getting hurt. That's a great thing. Thank you for coming out. Your presentation was wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Rick. Oh, Rick. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Wayne, uh, kind of a personal opinion from you. Uh, we all probably do a, a reasonably good job with fifth graders and the D.A.R.E. program in our police departments and our schools. Is it possible to either expand the D.A.R.E. program or to create a program addressing these issues that is like the D.A.R.E. program? I, I think that'd be a, a wonderful avenue. And you know, the D.A.R.E. currently addresses bullying and cyberbullying. Um, to have it go into the most, our most at-risk group is middle school. Mm -hmm. And to have it step into middle school, I think, would be a, a great opportunity to work with our kids and have our law enforcement connect with them. I, you know, I, I would suggest that you know, for every one of us in our, in our communities, this is probably a dialogue that is best had by the electeds, uh, both on the school board and on city councils, as well as our police departments. And, and you know, it's always about money at the end. And the DARE program costs money, mm -hmm. but I think the results of the DARE program are good. And I, I know I've seen our chief looking at those kids who were in high school going, I remember you. I remember you when you were a fifth grader. It's a little bit harder to say no now, isn't it? Because of peer pressure. 
but to be able to address some of these other issues, not necessarily the DARE program per se, but something like the DARE program. And you, you know, that would be up to all of those decision makers in the room to figure out how to do it. But it, it really strikes me that it, it is worth the small amount of money to get those kids in the, in the auditorium or in the gym of middle school yeah. and to be able to address some of these issues while there's still a chance that you can get to them before they become too jaded with all that's out there in the world. Uh, well, Mayor, Mayor Gibbs, if I may, uh, great ideas and suggestions. Also, there are many police agencies across the state that are implementing similar types of programs to deal with bullying and cyberbullying. And sometimes it, it's as easy as getting the information from another agency and seeing if we can implement it locally. With that, I, I hate to give you guys the plug, but the California School Resource Officers Association, uh, at the end of October in San Diego, we have our conference on bullying and cyberbullying. So school districts, community agencies, uh, and police departments from around the state will be sharing successful programs that they've implemented within bullying. And I would like to get the invitation out to the entire board here, task force here, uh, about that information on the conference. And we, I'd like to yeah, yeah, we have a, a, a very exhaustive school resource officer program here, and we work with our school district in that regard. We need that information. Yeah. Um, Kevin, could you make sure, because we'll get it in the hands of our school resource officer. And, and, and even though it's the California School Resource Officers Association, the conference is for community agencies, schools, law enforcement, uh, cities, school boards as well. Yeah, I'd like to take my operations director from the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I, I have a follow-up question. Uh, somebody brought to me uh, information uh, uh, about human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and uh, you know, I was very intrigued by it and, in fact, disgusted by it at the same time. But there was a part of it that um, uh, involved ch or... or uh, high schoolers or children exploiting other children um, to do things um, mm. that that really did fall under the category of trafficking. Well, you know, it's geez, you even hate to mention these things, but um, uh, blackmailing or bribing to have sex, making somebody through blackmail or bribing have sex with multiple people, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Have you done any, any research on that? Have you looked at its prevalence mm -hmm. among... You, you know, when we think of human trafficking, you think that it's in a foreign country or it's prostitution and it's out there. But we're starting to find out that it's really prevalent in our communities. In fact, it's in our schools in the manner I just described. And, 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 it's, and it's in our communities. And in fact, the, the example in a, in a book that somebody gave me was this was a middle class family. They were making money. They looked like Leave it to Beaver but their daughter was, was being exploited like that by, by some bullies, and she went out of the way to just cover it up and mm -hmm. keep it hidden, but it was going on right under the mom and dad's noses. Well, what have you done, if anything, about that? That is an emerging trend, uh, and typically, I don't know how the case that you, you saw, how it, how it shook out, but generally speaking, individuals will take a look online to see what they can find, and if they can find a compromising picture or video of an individual, they will contact that individual and basically say, unless you do this, this, or this, I'm gonna make this video public. I'm gonna put it on a website. I'm gonna send it to your friends. I'm gonna send it to your parents. Uh, and in these cases, they get individuals to escalate up. So at first, it is in your bedroom with your camera on your computer. I want you to do these things. And once they start to get that additional video, they have greater power over that person. Now they can extort them for the face-to-face. -face. Look, if you don't want me to now show this to your boyfriend, to the community, meet me, and you're mine is basically what's going on. So do we know or have you done any work as to its prevalence in our community? No, I think it's one of those emerging trends right now that I, I think that it is, one, it's emerging, and two, from exactly what you said is the issue of cover-up. If I am in a compromising video, I don't want anyone to know, and I'm not going to report it. So it's going to be very difficult to determine prevalence um, as well as the incidence issues with it. Um, but it is an emerging trend, and I know that uh, as a Oregon California School Resource Officers Association, we're beginning to track that kind of data and reports in from other areas as far as what they're saying. Um, but as far as a formal report, I'm not sure of anything at this point. If um, the task force concurred, I I'd like to um, add a, a session for us yeah. to look at that. 
Um, yes, Rita, go ahead. Just like to add that um, this has come to the attention to the local pastors group that I chair, and Olivia Barnes brought someone from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department with a number of video presentations and statistics for the local area of how prevalent this is and how widespread it is. So you may want to contact Olivia at Supervisor Stone's office and see if you can get that same person to come forward with that presentation. Uh, this I, excellent, scary, very scary. I just heard about this probably about three weeks ago. And when I think of human trafficking, I think of women being enslaved in another country. I never think about it in the terms that you just described. So that must have been what they were talking about. So I would like to learn more about it. And they said it was very prevalent. Mm -hmm. So Betsy, Melissa, let's let's go ahead and tag a session on and, and we'll contact Ms. Barnes and see what they know. It's sort of a uh, anecdote. It's probably about two or three years ago that uh, one of our police officers who happened to come out of the uh, San, San Diego gang detail before he got to Marietta, he's uh, <clears throat> driving the streets in one of our nice middle class neighborhoods and he goes, I know those guys. And they started investigating. It turned out that uh, some gangbangers had moved to Marietta, mm -hmm. uh, had a nice middle-class house, and they were running a teenage prostitution ring, uh, kids in our area. Uh, they're all doing hard time, but th they wouldn't have probably been so obvious if we hadn't had a police officer who had that experience and knew them. So it's just some other middle class guys walking around in the neighborhood, except this cop went, but I know these guys. Mm -hmm. yep. So, I, you know, I, I, the point I would make is we all say, oh, not in our area. That's the wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. Not in our area, not our kids. Mm -hmm. They're exposed. Mm -hmm. And so are we. Any more uh, yes. Just just one yeah. comment in relationship to this latest discussion. Um, there was a disturbing Supreme Court ruling uh, a couple of weeks ago, where they drew a very uh, distinct line in the sand between extortion and coercion and nullified a lower court's opinion that uh, acts of collusion could be prosecuted under um, uh, more restrictive laws. Uh, since the Supreme Court nullified that decision, said that coercion is basically okay that it's not extortion unless there's money involved. Uh, there needs to be, uh, the, at a national level, we need to relook at that proposition and uh, make sure that things that we thought were uh, prohibited under extortion laws are still prohibited. Uh, we're talking about uh, things like uh, coercive, uh, just as the example noted, uh, somebody does something as a teenager, we're gonna release it to the public unless you do something else. I'm very concerned that under the latest uh, law, that would be considered coercion rather than extortion, and there's basically nothing to cover it. So as legislators, uh, one thing we can probably do is get with uh, uh, whoever the, uh, your, our local congressmen are and uh, suggest that we take a relook at what needs to be done to make sure that those extortion type issues are still covered uh, uh, in light of the new Supreme, Supreme Court ruling. Thanks, Kim. Any other comments from the panel? Well, we have about 10 minutes left, and I think it's important if anybody from the public uh, wants to come forward and have anything to say about the topic, uh, we'll certainly afford the time. Wayne, you might want to just kind of stand by on the side in case a question pops up for you. Um, would anybody like to speak? I don't, uh, yes, sir, come on forward. If you can just state your name for the record, as in the microphone there. Yeah, my name is James Smith, and I'm relatively new here to Temecula. And uh, I must say I'm very encouraged to see after this uh, stimulating talk that immediately uh, actions are, are in the plan, you know. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. Also, uh, but where would this be on the Temecula website? I want to immediately uh, be able to pass this on. If you, um, the lady right behind you here raising her hand right there, okay. we'll give you a link. Okay. She'll tell you where to find it. Okay, and uh, also, um, thank you so much. Uh, the, you know, we have,
PC cleaners and things like this, and is there anything for these four victims that can kind of erase some of this or put blocks on some of these things that come up? Yeah, absolutely. That if, especially if come forward, Doc, so, so we get you on tape. No, no, that's okay. It, yes, real good question is, if it is a Facebook or other social media, uh, then that there can be blocks put on so that I don't have to take the information um, from everyone. The problem is, is that you, if, if I block certain individuals from posting up or seeing, my friends will still see it and will still tell me. Um, so, and kids will tell you that I'd rather not block because I want to know what's being said about me. And it's the same thing for any adult is, you know, rather than putting my head in the sand, I want to know what you're saying about me. I want to look at the postings and try to defend myself. Well, you know, um, how do you get around the First Amendment aspect of that? Um, I mean, people, even children, at least I think so, have a right to go online and say what they want to say. And, and, and if they don't like somebody, they certainly have the ability to get on there and do that. There's no limits to that. I, 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 I don't know. Well, have, you, have you looked into that? or? or I, I, I think for us at schools, it, that becomes the issue of the jurisdictional issues. If it begins to impact an individual's attendance, academics, or receiving school services, the individual who has, is causing this has violated their civil rights, their right to a free and appropriate public education. Um, and so I, I, I think that while there is the freedom of expression, uh, there is also the issue of harming individuals via words or text or videos or whatever it might be. And that's where the whole cyberbullying issue comes in. And as, as we know, schools operate off separate rules uh, than general society as mm -hmm. well. So if it was, and that's why we have to show the nexus to the school. If it's home computer, home computer, middle of the night, it's a community issue that parents need to iron out. Um, it's more difficult for us for, as schools to intervene. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Just to comment on that last part, because uh, I understand what you're saying, the separation between the schools and, 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 and the residents' homes, and so, but we still collaboratively have to work together. What starts at school ends up in the neighborhood. What starts in the neighborhood definitely affects the schools, especially a weekend typical uh, scenario. If something happens in the weekend, it's going to carry over Monday morning right mm -hmm. to the schools. So yeah. to, to, to separate, I don't think, is a good idea. I think we all, between law enforcement, the school district, community members, and parents, we all have to work collect, uh, collaboratively together. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to at least try to make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments by the panel? I don't see any uh, by the public. So um, our next meeting is when, Betsy? Do we have it on the calendar? October 17th. And the topic will be? Uh, October 17th. Uh, substance abuse. Okay, and then we'll work on a, uh, on a human trafficking uh, um, uh, session as well. One last call to the panel. I, I think this was very stimulating. Um, and uh, now let's take it back to our communities and do something with it. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here, both in, in the audience and, and here on the panel. Have a pleasant night. We are adjourned.